Well, welcome everybody to today's episode of Wise Lives. My name's Nick and I'm going to be speaking today with my friend Ben Woolard all about the workplace. How can we see work as worship? How does our Christian faith translate into the everyday lives that most of us lead, which don't include, you know, coming to church and having a lot of time to pray and worship, but they do include spending our whole lives on behalf of God. So, um, welcome, Ben. It's great to be with you. Great to be here, Nick. Thank you. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. We've known each other for a few years. Uh, tell us and our listeners a little bit about your your work background and why you are passionate about this. I'm really excited to talk about this today. It's something I'm really interested in. And those listening, this is an area of pain that I think a lot of followers of Jesus in the workplace carry. Either they know it or it's just under the surface. So a bit about me, I live in Stannington. Uh, I've married to the wonderful Amanda, who's a nurse, and we've got two daughters, age six and two. Very Evie, nice, Evie very cute they are. Yeah, they are, they're very cute, very noisy. I feel like part of my journey has been carrying this tension and walking through it. So straight out of university, I got a job in recruitment and was helping people find jobs. And then I bumped into the wonderful Ronan Walker on a train one day, who some of you will know. He was a prison chaplain in Doncaster Prison, which we call Doncatras. And he said, why don't you come into the prison with me one day a week as a volunteer chaplain? And at the time I was uh, working in recruitment and I said to my boss, put me on a four day week. You get to pay me less and I'll still hit the same targets. All right. And she said, no, it can't be done in recruitment. You have to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, et cetera, et cetera. A bit different from the sort of hybrid world that we're in now, Nick. Mm. My hand was forced, and in order to follow what I felt that God had said, I started my own recruitment company so I could go into the prison with Ronan one day a week. Now, in my mind at that time, the thinking was essentially this. I will change my work schedule so I can do the God bit one day a week. Right. And although I'd seen God use me and move in the workplace a little bit, my thinking was very much restricted by this idea that there's a God thing out there to do, which we call ministry. And then there's a work thing out there to do, which we've just got to get on with. Yeah. And never the twain shall meet. And they they shouldn't meet. And although we use the language of there's no sacred secular divide our experience and the way we live our lives and the way we communicate what we value shows that actually there is. And that journey uh, really showed me that God can move just as much in the workplace as he can in an official ministry environment. And actually, the workplace is a phenomenal arena for discipleship. Yeah. So just tell us about, um, so you were working recruitment, you were doing a day a week. What happened then? From there, uh, the business grew because it turns out that when you recruit with the values of Jesus in mind and truth telling is a USP in the recruitment industry, unfortunately, people want to do business with you. So that business and the team there grew. um, And then meanwhile, my prison work uh, transitioned into starting a project called Emergency Department Pastors in uh, the hospital in Sheffield. Um, And then that day a week was used for official sort of frontline ministry work in Pittsmoor and there were a number of different areas that I was working in then uh, the business grew and after about five or six years the opportunity came to sell the company to a larger group so I sold the business to a larger group and then felt it was right to transition uh, more into uh, working for charity so work for Together for Sheffield and we run a number of ministry and charitable projects which I do on a four-day week but I've always kept up Uh, consulting and um, coaching particularly in the pharmaceutical and tech industry so for the last few years um, at least one day a week I'll be doing coaching and training um, senior executives from the pharma and and tech industry oh that's that's cool okay wow and um, I think I think I'd love before uh, long I'd love to just reel back to one thing you just said about truth telling and uh, and can we have a, a Kingdom of God USP in our workplace? Um, before we do that, how about uh, I'll just tell uh, guys listening in as well. Um, before I was a minister, I actually had a proper job as well. Um, so I came out of university and I worked for a company which is now called PwC. They're a, an, an, a global firm 
There were, I think, about 14 or 12 or 14,000 employees in the UK and about 100 and something thousand around the world. And uh, I worked in marketing. I started right at the bottom as I actually started as a shelf stacker and a box moverer and all that as a student job. And then I worked my way through, did marketing exams with the Chartered Institute of Marketing and I became a marketing manager and I used to travel down to London uh, once or twice a week uh, and also be based out of the, she- the Sheffield office doing kind of national projects. Actually, at the time, it was e-commerce that we were de- designing. And the reason that I got the, the role on, on being a project manager on designing e-commerce websites was because we were the youngest <laughs> which was like, right, well, you're the ones who will understand this e-commerce thing that was just emerging at the time. Anyway, so I worked there for 10 years and uh, I learned a lot of lessons about about work as worship. I think that was the crucial thing that the Lord taught, taught me. Uh, I had to nail for myself was that you can do a good job, but if you choose with a mindset that says, actually, what I do with my time is worship to God wherever I am, then you can you can learn to see your work even on the hard days and the annoying days and you know the long travel days and all the rest of it as worship to God and I and I chose and I had to make that kind of breakthrough in my mind and it it really changed everything for, for me in terms of the way I, I I think it helped me to be more fruitful at work and definitely more peaceful in the thing that God had me to do for that season of my life so uh, and, and actually I only worked four days a week then as well I did the same thing as you I, I approached my boss uh, I was on the brink of landing this new contract and I waited till they said we want to give you the contract and then I said could I do four days a week please <laughs> and there was a pause and it you know it took a couple of days and they came back and and they said why and I said well I want I actually it was it was a similar thing I wanted to study theology and I wanted to have a day because I was living in in a city area in Sheffield to serve the area the church um, uh, as well and so uh, I, the the first time I had a full time five day a week job was when I worked for the church. Good work. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, you said that uh, you're in your workplace. You tried to in the business you were running. You tried to have a USP of truth telling and kingdom values. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So when we had staff come in, uh, if they were from the recruitment industry, I would re- have to retrain them not to lie. Wow. And so I talked about integrity and integrity having a value. So, for example, Nick, if you were to stand up and leave a crisp £5 note on your seat and leave the room and I was to pocket that, I'm valuing my integrity at £5 because I'm selling my integrity for that £5 that you've left behind. And lots of us will have moments when we're really tempted or sometimes cross that line and sell our integrity for a low value. So I'd use this as a way of talking to the staff about what our integrity was worth and what they personally would value it at. Uh, as a way of retraining them. And another thing, the business model of recruitment means that quick wins are incentivized at the cost of long-term relationships. So I'd have to get people to picture that we were in long-term relationships with our client and building for the long-term. And that's why we had clients come to us again and again. But I also got to see God really give me direction in the workplace. So after I'd started the business, I went to sleep and I had a dream. And in the dream, um, God opened a bit of paper and on the bit of paper it said, contact IT support companies. Right. Very beautiful, clear dream. That is, yes, okay. So the next day I woke up, created a list of IT support companies to phone. The second one gave us a contract and the whole business was initially built on supplying IT support engineers for businesses across Sheffield and it became our niche. Okay, so God had, had, had inspired you supernaturally in a dream and, that, and, and that's what opened the door for the, for the business. That's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, and that's nothing to do with evangelism. Yeah. That's nothing to do with someone hearing the gospel and saying yes. And as you know, that's something I'm also really passionate about. And I think it's giving ourselves permission to think about as people in business, as people in the workplace, we are building culture that God wants to use that is that is good. So the first commission of Eden is to fill the earth and subdue it. So if you're listening to this right now, part of your role is to just bring godly values into your workplace. I think traditional church is very comfortable about talking about work as evangelism because it helps churches grow when you evangelize in your workplace. But actually work as worship is a slightly different distinction. And people listening right now, your work 
is is worship so you can have an in, encounter or see god use you through a spreadsheet through building godly systems through treating people well in the workplace and that is just as much value as if you come to a 24 7 prayer evening because the role for the follower of jesus is simply to follow him where he's leading you and that's not always in these kind of overt christian spaces that that we feel very comfortable expressing our spirituality in that's right, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, 90 whatever percent of the time, you, you're just doing the job, you, you're, you're getting on with people. But people can see it. I can remember uh, in in my workplace in PwC, people could uh, see uh, when you're values driven, like you're, what you're describing as being a values driven organization. And, they, and if you're a person like that, ultimately, they'll seek people will seek you out from time to time. Um, because even though you're not trying to show off and project that whatever, it just shines through because it does. It's very attractive to people to see the kingdom of God values in another person. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, the the background. What's the what's the foundation? What's the theology? Uh, how can you and I sit here and say work is worship? So, if we look at the Hebrew, so the word um, for worship is abad, a b a d, which is also the same word for worship. Uh, in the Bible, in scripture. So that's why we can say work is worship. That's amazing. Because within the God view and conception of what our work is, it's it's worshipful. And I sometimes think as people who lean towards evangelicalism, we can oversimplify and we just create these false dichotomies of the good thing is dragging someone from your workplace into church. Right. Everything else doesn't really matter. Right. And actually what this does is it really breaks that when all of our work is a gift to god when all of it is an offering suddenly we don't have to play that sort of status value game of what's more or less important and if there's one thing i could say to listeners today it would be to really identify where your belief system is broken in in this way if you do believe bottom down that actually if you were to leave what you did now and become a church leader, God would value it more, then it probably shows that there's just some misaligned thinking. Yeah, there. and I, I just remember that um, actually in the Old Testament, one of the first people that the Old Testament shows was filled with the Holy Spirit was a craftsperson, was an artisan. It was the people who, who were given to, to create things like the gold ornaments and the silver uh, kind of designs within, I think, in the temple. It's Bezalel. Oh, there you go. Thank so you. So Bezalel is filled with the Holy Spirit, first person recorded by Scripture to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the outworking of that is creating beautiful craft. Yeah. So for you interior designers out there, the Holy Spirit is your competitive advantage. Yes. I mean, the Holy Spirit really is a competitive advantage. I, I remember a friend of mine who used to work, he's a project manager in development, in pro- big scale kind of building development. And uh, he was uh, getting a, a supermarket set up in a city not far from here. And he kept hitting the wall, like in the project management. We are talking about needing to build roads and knock down large scale buildings and re, you know, rebuild. So it was a big supermarket complex. And uh, he tell, so told me one time, I, well, I just went into the toilets and I prayed in tongues. Um, because I couldn't think of anything else to get through this. And when I came back to the desk, I had this inspiration and I, I understood what how to approach this project and this problem. And then he got the breakthrough. And so uh, we should not underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit at work. Yeah, and Jesus wants to be involved in our day-to-day. Again, if you look at the way God's crafted creation, there's loads of extra beautiful things that seem superfluous to just pure functionality. And so we can take from that that actually if we're involved in creating beauty, God's, God wants to be part of that. We're, we're part of helping build a culture in the workplace. God wants to be part of that. If we're part of doing what some people might see as simple um, and mundane activities, Jesus wants to sit next with us in the midst of those tasks. And that's part of our discipleship. And, that's, um, and, and from the very beginning as well, I mean, part of following God in the Garden of Eden uh, and following his work you know we, we're designed to name and to to have authority over the earth uh, and and to till the soil and so on afterwards and and that's right there in the beginning uh, as a as a good thing god saw create creativity and and authority over uh, i suppose work in terms of using resources for your benefit you know um that's capitalism but anyway let's not go there as a godly thing as a good thing 
Okay, so where else does it does the does the theology come from? So if we look at lots of Paul's writings, um, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. Work as though you're working for God. So Paul has this real understanding that we're working, that our work, we have a higher master in the workplace. And lots of us, and if you've got a difficult boss or difficult colleagues, this is a real help to actually reposition your heart and reframe it that it's not that person you're working for. It's actually God and it's for his glory that at the end of the day, you can take a moment with him and say, this was for you. Yeah, I mean, even Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and he's, and in that letter, in 1 Timothy, he says, even if you're a slave, you know, and you're a Christian and you're working for a master, don't don't treat him any differently. Do a good job. Now that doesn't, you know, that's not a comment on slavery. That's a comment on you. You can you can honor God in your work, in your present lifestyle, whatever it is. Uh, let's talk about somebody else who who had to learn how to honor God in a difficult situation. What about Joseph? Going back a bit, yeah. So Joseph, one of the real controversial ones, if you really think about it, because he was employed in a really ungodly system. He was working for Pharaoh. Obviously, we know the story sold into slavery and rose through his prophetic gift through the ranks. But if you think about who he was benefiting, and I don't say this lightly, but it wouldn't be too different from someone working for Vladimir Putin's regime, because yeah. that is the same way that the uh, that Pharaoh was oppressing the Jewish people of the time. So you've got Joseph in there bringing his best gifts to bear, helping Pharaoh gain a profit because God was using him in that place. But actually, because his heart was submitted to God and God's ways are not our ways, those acts that Joseph did actually helped break down part of the system and God had a higher purpose for it. And so it's possible for us to work in unethical systems. So there'll be people listening to that, that, you know, you mentioned capitalism earlier, would feel really strongly about our, the brokenness of our world system. Sure. But the, the glorious redemptive invitation from Jesus is that as his followers, we get to engage with the mud and the muck of this world. And through us, he will redeem it. I love that. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's mud and muck, isn't it? And yeah, I love that. So so let's think about another story of redemption. I'm just, as you're talking, we're, we're thinking about, um, say, Nehemiah, cupbearer to the king. You know, he, he had a job close to the royal court as well, in a foreign land, actually. It wasn't his homeland. He was working away. Then God spoke to him and stirred his heart for a different project. He was a project manager, basically, wasn't he? And some of it worked well and some of it didn't. But let's talk about how, how what we can learn from that. Yeah, I think the book of Nehemiah is hugely overlooked in terms of theology of, of work and worship. And also, if you're listening to this and you're someone who's more pragmatic, you find long prophetic conversations, you switch off a bit and you get distracted and you're a bit of a doer. And sometimes people accuse you of being more of a Martha than a Mary. Then Nehemiah is the book for you. Certainly, he certainly is focused. So you've got some long prayers from Nehemiah, but as the work gets started, his prayers become shorter and shorter. There's literally these one line prayers that Nehemiah says, and it's like, God, help us build this thing. And off they go. And so what Nehemiah does is he project manages the rebuilding of a huge wall around Jerusalem. And there's some amazing parts in Nehemiah. So I think it's the third or fourth chapter. It says, when the people worked with all of their hearts and the wall was only half built and so you get this amazing halfway point that then Nehemiah's strategy really comes into play so he has to do things like getting half the team to build while the other half are defending them with swords and what's really interesting is he's really aware of the human nature for um, self-advancement so he says to people build the wall in front of your house Right. So it's the original fundraising campaign where it's like you get to put your name on the brick or your name on the placard. Right. It's, and, and he realises what will motivate the people. Yeah, he realises how people are motivated. And actually, if you're building the wall in front of your house, you're going to be more motivated. And so he employs these really clever, strategic ways of engaging a whole population in doing a godly act. But essentially, he is a project manager, moved by faith. But what you don't see in Nehemiah is... Uh, Nehemiah decided that he should pray rather than help build the wall. Or Nehemiah right. decided he would disappear for a month and go on a prayer retreat um, and not actually bother organising people. And actually, if you carry some of the wrong thinking that some of us have for all to its full conclusion, 
in terms of work, it would be something like none of us should work in anything other than uh, a, a church role. Yeah, a clearly very worthy project or something. Or other. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and this actually dates back to uh, George Whitfield. So George Whitfield, phenomenal evangelist, preached. 18,000 times over 30 years. Somewhere in the uh, 1700s yeah. around there, yeah. Yeah, so saw a huge um, revival through the UK and the States. But he, any follower who would come to him that was high up in business or politics, he would say, you need to come out of that world into the church world. Wow. And I would say some of that thinking, wrong mm. thinking, is still within our theology mm. that... We, we do have this false dichotomy. I was talking to a church leader recently and he said, oh, I've got my theology of work and worship down, but I decided as a church leader, the reason I wanted to be a church leader is because I wanted to be involved in something that would be eternal. Wow. And it's this idea that somehow if you work for church, you're involved in an eternal thing, whereas if you don't, you're involved in a temporal thing. Yeah. Whereas the reality is that actually we're all part of building something. We're all part of building the new creation and heaven's going to come to earth. And what what's Jesus going to find in our obedience, in our culture creating and what we're making here and now? Quite. And uh, just to be fair to some other church leaders, many of them are actually bivocational these days. Uh, there's a dear friend of mine, Isaac, uh, in the city who's, who leads a majority black uh, church. And the first time I met him was in the job centre when I needed a job, when I was between jobs. He was my case manager. And we've been friends ever since. And he's uh, leading a spiritual community outside of um, the day job let's talk about the practicalities ben because it's you know there's the theology and actually i'm really struck by almost every example i can think of someone in scripture who's named often they're they're accompanied by what they do what their job is and so um, women as well as men so people like lydia who was the uh, merchant in purple cloth where um paul set up a a new faith community uh, and the fishermen and uh, the tax collectors and all the rest of them they they all had jobs and and they what they had to learn what does full-time ministry really mean you know are we talking about the kind of classic view of church or are we talking about i'm always i mean i'm always a missionary because i'm always following god's mission that mm. i join in with and i'm always on ministry because you know talking to somebody or bringing a word of life to somebody at the coffee machine is ministry or doing a good job with good values or providing employment for somebody else or doing a brilliant haircut that gives somebody joy on their night out is also ministering to them. Yeah, and I think part of this is how do we as followers of Jesus and church communities communicate what we value? And so when I'm talking to um, Christians who are in full-time work, I'll often say something like, hands up if you can remember the last time at the front of church, someone going on two week mission trip was prayed for and all the hands will go up. And then I'll say, hands up if you can remember the last time someone who had a significant authority in the workplace, maybe hired people or as a manager, was brought up and blessed because of the influence they have in their city through their work. And very few times will the hands go up. And my observation and my thinking about what happens, and we can back this around a bit, is that as human beings, we're wired to try and understand what is worthy, what is given status and value in the communities we're part of. And so if you're part of a church and your only experience of it is a Sunday, then what the message that you will be subtly picking up is if you're doing official God work in ministry and going and talking to people about Jesus and evangelizing, that's really valuable. But if you're not doing those things and if you're a doctor or if you're a business person or if you're a salesperson, then actually it's not spoken about. You will naturally begin to feel less valued. Yeah. And you might think, oh, but if I was on the worship team, I'd be more valued in this community. Mm. Or if I volunteered at this thing, I'd be more valued in this community. Well, so I can understand from the church point and from my point of view, and if anyone's ever felt that from our perspective, I do apologise sincerely. But let's practically, for the people going into work tomorrow morning, can you give us some practical tips about how do you help yourself to see work as worship and to, and to feel fulfilled in the everyday? Yeah, so firstly, this is discipleship, so it's worked out in community. So talk with the people you're close with, talk with your small group, talk with your community about how you experience the workplace. Because we're all very good at compartmentalising. Some people will be listening to this and be like, oh my goodness, I've completely compartmentalised my work from my spirituality and my faith. Yeah. 
and that's something that then yep. you need to address so really practically it's it's a heart position it's understanding that your first role is that you are a follower of Jesus in the workplace you're a marketplace minister who's being sent out that doesn't mean you need to slip God into every conversation and you've got something else on your to-do list it means that actually as you surrender to Jesus and abide in him he longs to work through you now like any relationship I'd suggest invite him into it so say as I work today I really just need you by my side because I find it hard to switch off and just start praying at random points but I want you to be part of the conversation so in the same way that if you had a mentor who you really respected come into the workplace with you, expect Jesus to work with you. I remember one time in my recruitment work, uh, this was when I was working for someone else, I went in and on my way in, I felt the Holy Spirit whisper, expect my blessing. Yeah. I then got a phone call from um, a young Nigerian guy who just moved to the country looking for work with a really specific skill set. I couldn't help him at all, but I said I noted down his details. Three minutes later, I got an inbound phone call from a company looking for that exact skill set. Right. That was the blessing God had asked me to Mm. expect because in recruitment, you get paid for putting the right person in the right job. That's when you get your money. So I phoned him up. He got the job. His wife, who had the same skill set of him, as him, also got a job there. Aww. So I got two placements. What I found out later is they were a Christian couple that had been praying for the job that they needed to stay in the UK. Wow. And it's now over 10 years later, and I still get messages from them saying, if it wasn't for that, our whole lives would be different, and God really used you wow. to get us into the right position. Wow. So there were some praying people, and the Holy Spirit looked for someone who whose antenna was up. Yeah, who was attentive enough. Yeah. And then and then there's the practical job of work where you put them in touch, you do the emails, you do all of that stuff as well. There's the finance. Exactly. That's, that's not detached from the move of God. Isn't no. that exciting? Yeah. Great story, Ben. Well, listen, I think it would be great if we just pause for ourselves as we listen to this and just pray now because uh, each of us will be in different situations with what we do during our time. Um, and if you're not you know, in the workplace right now, perhaps you're raising children or you're retired or you've got something else on, you will know plenty of people in the, in the, in the workplace. I love what, what did you say? Um, marketplace marketplace ministers ministers we're we're all effectively marketplace ministers so if you go to website worship.works you can read about work at marketplace ministry another resource would be the licc so google those and these are amazing ministries that are creating a uh, good theological understanding of us serving god for our work 100 percent. i love licc's uh, resources ben would you pray for us we'll just wait on the lord and uh Ask him to empower us in in our everyday. Jesus, thank you for the gift of work. And we need you. We need you to see our lives and our work the way that you see them. And forgive us where we have harboured bitterness or ungodly understanding of what our work is and what it can be. And help and heal us as we seek for our work to be as worshipful as our song on a Sunday. Amen. Amen. Uh, Ben, thank you so much for coming in. It's been great to spend time with you. I hope that whatever's next in your working day is fruitful. Amen. Yeah, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Yeah, look forward to it. Thank you. Cheers.